Lovely, thank you very much. It's a, it's a privilege to be here, um, privilege to be here in person, and I'd like to thank uh, both Courtney and Charlie for, for inviting me. Uh, so I'm really going to kind of discuss some of the risk factors for, or the known risk factors for bone stress injuries and some kind of strategies for, for mitigating that risk. I'm just going to start with a bit of a historical context here of bone stress injuries, and they were first clinically diagnosed back in 1855 by the Prussian doctor, I won't try and pronounce his name, who recognised in uh, soldiers marching uh, uh, symptoms and reports of foot and leg swelling when they, were, uh, when they were undertaking prolonged marching, and these were termed march fractures. And the march fractures are really characterised, as we see here in the cortex of the, um, uh, of the long bone, as a, as a crack um, kind of propagating here. And we can see it here again in, in this other kind of image. Um, and this is a histological kind of image of, of a micro crack, and here we can see it kind of um, interspersed with these um, osteons. So when female runners, um, stress fractures or bone stress injuries, as we, as we term them, now typically happen at the weight bearing sites. So here we have the, the metatarsals, the, the tibia, fibula, the, the femur, and um, more commonly in women at the, at the hip. They occur in about 20% of runners, um, and they have a tendency to recur. So anybody with that, any runner or athlete with a, a, um, a bone stress injury, about two thirds have a history of a bone stress injury. So there is a recurrence and a tendency to re-injure. Just to kind of put a, kind of like some context in terms of, um, of, of the bone structure here. So typically in the long bones, uh, the structure is very, very different to, to that of the hip. At the hip here, we have the characteristics of, of, of the spongy bone, the high content of trabecular bone. And the, the structure of the bone here really reflects the compressive stresses that, um, that, are, that attenuate the, the loading from, from axial compression. And we have very similar bone structure at the, um, at the ultradistal uh, tibia um, and also the calcaneus as well. So there, there is a possibility that the etiology of stress fractures might be different for the trabecular um, dominant sites compared with the, with the cortical dominant sites. And also the, um, the, the reason why obviously bone stress injuries are a particular problem to athletes or, or to the military is because they do take a long time to heal. And quite often in our populations at least, they result in medical discharge because they're just very difficult to get some of these individuals, some of these cases back into physically active training. So we broadly categorised risk factors into the loads, into, into the factors that modify the loads applied to the bone, and those are largely on the right-hand side here, which is the ability of bone to, to resist those loads. And the ability of bone to resist those loads really is dependent on the structure, uh, the structure of bone, the architecture of bone, and more recently now we can image the bone uh, with, with a higher resolution, is the microarchitecture of that bone, which you see here. So I'm really largely going to cover some of the factors on this side of the, of the, um, of the figure. When, um, well, whether it's the, the training environment or the ability of bone to resist these loads or the bone stiffness uh, really kind of influences how the bone responds to that load. And when the bone um, is unable to resist those loads, this, the, the, um, the bone responds by accelerating bone remodeling from the development of these microcracks, which progress into a stress reaction, kind of edema, and right through to a complete fracture. So if you have a look at bone remodeling, and it's really important to understand the bone biology in order to really identify effective mitigation strategies. So this is a bone remodeling cycle, um, and bone can be resorbed um, through kind of what we would call stochastic modelling, which is where hormones, parathyroid hormone or, or oestrogen can stimulate, um, or the lack of oestrogen can stimulate osteoclastogenesis. Once the bone is, is resorbed, uh, the osteoblasts kind of follow suit and they um, repair the bone, fill the bone, that will probably take up to a, a full year before the bone becomes really kind of fully strong again. But this is a really important uh, reparation process and even as we sat here around, uh, everybody will be experiencing bone remodeling kind of most of the time because the skeleton is very clever, recognises the need to improve its mechanical integrity so it will reabsorb bone and it will reform bone, driven by hormonal factors. Now with bone stress injuries and what we observe in our populations, they can occur even within two to three weeks of starting a very new heavy training programme. And so as the micro crack kind of develops in bone uh, through this kind of heightened um, sudden onset of loading, the micro crack disturbs these um, osteocytes. Osteocytes are the mechanical sensors um, of the bone. They are uh, interconnected by this network 
Alvan caniculi, and disturbance of the osteocytes propagates and stimulates the onset of osteoclastogenesis. And this event can occur really, really rapidly. And here, what we have here with um, what we call targeted remodeling, we have this micro crack in bone, and you can see the bone reabsorption and the osteoclast working towards this micro crack to reabsorb and repair the bone. And we see this really nicely in military models. And uh, the challenge with understanding the etiology of injuries in, in runners, it's more about kind of individual, individual kind of sport nature. And it's hard to, to collect very kind of um, standardized data uh, where all those confounding factors and the, 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 the factors that modify bone are controlled. So in the military where we have large cohorts coming into training, they wear the same kit, they eat at the same time, they typically have very, very similar sleep patterns. A lot of those factors are well, we, not controlled, but they are very similar. So in this cohort study that was published um, just a few years ago, this is... Um, this is um, the time in training, this is um, week one of training, and what we can see, this is the, time, this is the, the onset of heightened loading, and we can see that stress fractures in both men and women peak at around three to four weeks into training. So this is a classic targeted remodeling, and with the increase in bone reabsorption, small reabsorption pits are left, are, are, you know, re remain on bone, and it reduces the bone stiffness. Now, bone remodeling is, is a sequential process, so after the bone is resorbed, there's a period of crenescence, so about a week where the bone is dormant, so these reabsorption pits um, with continued training uh, result in kind of micro cracks and, and can propagate micro damage and then bone starts to form thereafter and this is where we see a reduction in stress factor. This is obviously just um, also influenced by the nature of training that takes place from here in. So this is really classically the targeted remodeling as you can see here. This is the micro crack, an increase in, in bone reabsorption. Uh, but importantly, with this increase in bone formation, even though it takes place as probably about kind of eight weeks with this total cycle, the bone isn't really that strong in the first couple of months post, um, post uh, new bone formation. And it takes up to 12 months for bone to fully mineralize and to, re and to uh, regain its full strength. This graph on the right-hand side, I just want to kind of highlight there are sex differences in this environment between men and women. And you can see up to a fourfold greater risk of stress fractures in women compared to men. And this is what's, what, what's common in, in military recruits, but also what's common in other sports as well. So just to cover off, um, and I think importantly, is that bone is a very hierarchical tissue. There's seven different layers of bones. It's very complex. And when we talk about bone health and bone strength, I think it's easy just to think, well, how mineralized is the bone? Uh, and that's because there are standardized ways to measure bone health. DEXA, dual energy x-ray geometry is used to, to, um, to determine the amount of mineral that's laid down in bone. But bone is influenced a lot more than just by its mineral content. The shape plays a really, really pivotal role. So the size, the cortical thickness, really influences the strength of bone and the ability to resist those bending stresses. And we now have the tools to be able to measure uh, with great resolution, particularly with a high-res PQCT, the microarchitecture, the macroarchitecture and, and the shape of bone. What we haven't really particularly got at yet in vivo is uh, measuring the, the tissue components. And again, the tissue components will play a role in bone strength, but it's difficult um, to, to measure the, t the, the tissue properties. We do have a new technique that we're looking at at the moment, but again, it, it needs a lot of development. So if we just have a look at it, for a given mass under loading, uh, the bending um, stiffness, and the bending stiffness, if you think about a, a thin stick and a fat stick and you apply this axle loading, you know the thin stick is going to break first. And these are, this is the principle that I'm referring to here. So you've got um, this, uh, at, the, at the same given bone mass, bending stiffness will increase markedly, as will axle stiffness, as the cross-sectional area of the bone increases. So it's really important in terms of either preventive strategies or, or interventional strategies that we increase the cross-sectional area of bone. So the, what we call a periosteal expansion, the, the bone grows outwards. However, post-adolescence is very difficult to achieve um, or to increase periosteal opposition. And the best time to really uh, improve bone strength is in the pubescent period. And there are studies that have uh, been conducted um, that kind of has proven that, particularly with tennis players looking at the playing arm versus the non-playing arm. Um, and the, and the, 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 the proposition behind that uh, kind of benefit is that the, as bone is growing in, in puberty and those osteoblasts are sitting on the surface of bone already, they're easier to recruit and to, and to therefore uh, grow the bone.
So what we really want to try and achieve is this shift in, this is the, uh, the um, stress strain curve, and it's to shift that bone stiffness to the left so it's better able to resist uh, the, stre the, the loads applied to bone. Uh, the problem and the issue is with women is that biologically they have a smaller, um, a narrower cross-sectional area of bone compared with men. Uh, this is um, kind of an image from military recruits um, uh, from both the ultradistal site and from the, um, the tibial diaphysis. And this is typically where we see stress fractures with, um, with weight-bearing exercise. You can see that the, the bone is much bigger in men compared with women. And that's because during puberty, and these are the, the men here and the women here, androgens have a, an effect on the periosteal surface to increase the cross-sectional area. Uh, in women, the cross-sectional area doesn't really change during puberty, and estrogen has preferential and targeted effects more on the endocortical bone and really kind of reduces the, um, the endocortical um, size. And there's an evolutionary uh, kind of perspective on this, is to really have uh, preserve the calcium stores for pregnancy. But it does have a negative impact when it comes to weight-bearing exercise. What we have here on the left-hand side is the pathological loop for a bone stress injury with a load, um, the, how the, how the uh, bone responds to that load, increased in strain, and pathologically with targeted remodeling, this will result um, in the um, increase in bone reabsorption and then the potential for increased stress fracture risk or bone stress injury risk. Well, really, what we want to, and of course, that strain is influenced by a number of factors. What we want to encourage is more the, what we would call bone adaptation, where the osteocytes are not, um, they don't experience apoptosis, but they actually, they are perturbed um, just to really kind of stimulate um, osteoblastogenesis and to increase that bone formation. So we published a paper just um, last year which was looking at strategies to try and really promote the, um, the ad adaptation of bone. And there are certain things that bone really likes. It likes short duration exercise, split up into uh, discrete exercise bouts, the high impact, but it doesn't like this prolonged pounding and it doesn't kind of respond favorably to prolonged pounding. Very similar to the way can tendons, ligaments respond as well to, um, to exercise. And so we published this paper um, and we reviewed some of the ideal conditions to promote um, um, bone health with exercise, uh, ranging from obviously getting ade adequate sleep, maintaining um, the sex steroid hormones, uh, I'll briefly mention later the, uh, the use of NSAIDs and, um, and some of these kind of variables of, of nutrition. So I'm just going to just cover, because I haven't got time to cover much else, um, the, the concepts around um, menstrual status and feeding. So you'll all be familiar with these frameworks. I'm just going to focus initially on the female athlete the triad. Um, this was a framework that was um, kind of recognized in a position stance by the uh, ACSM a couple of decades ago. And there's an interrelationship between um, energy availability, um, or the original model was um, kind of uh, disordered or eating disorders, uh, bone health, bone mass, or a clinical endpoint of which is osteoporosis, and functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. And again, the, the, there was um, a paper that was published later which recognised that there's only a continuum from optimal energy availability through to um, low energy availability. So any athlete or recruit could really kind of sit anywhere along this continuum. And what really influences energy availability, in addition to the kind of purposeful kind of eating disorders, is just not um, kind of recognising that with increased energy um, expenditure, nutrition needs to obviously um, be kind of appropriate to, to, re to replenish those energy stores. So it could be unintentional as well as intentional. And similarly with the, um, with the continuum here with, um, with bone health, from optimal bone health, bone stress injuries will really sit along that continuum um, before uh, sort of uh, kind of clinically diagnosed uh, kind of bone disease is diagnosed. So this continuum is really important because this is probably where we really do sit in the kind of midpoints even with menstrual status and the, the subclinical um, kind, of, uh, kind of menstrual disorders, uh, where uh, maybe many of the athletes would, would sit, and certainly many, many of our recruits. There has been another framework that's been published um, since, which is the rel relative energy deficiency in sports. So again, the emphasis is on energy availability, and recognizing there's a lot more clinical outcomes um, and performance outcomes which can be affected by energy availability. But we need to the evidence largely sits in the literature uh, with this interrelationship between, between bone, menstrual status, and, uh, and energy. 
We know that um, amen and rig athletes are more prone to bone stress injuries um, compared to their human and rig counterparts. And, and estrogen plays a central role in bone metabolism. It's probably one of the most important hormones which really um, kind of controls our bone turnover. It stops the bone reabsorbing and it promotes bone formation. So any decreases in, that, in our endogenous estrogens, even in men, has a direct negative impact on bone. And uh, so these are data showing um, that these are comparing uh, the different menstrual status groups and the uh, prevalence of stress factors in this study was almost ninefold higher compared with human and athletes. And that's very consistent in, in the literature. We've known that uh, for, for many years. And there's also um, a decrease in bone mineral density in a human compared to non human uh, athletes. On the right hand side is taking that model kind of further still. And I looked at those um, risk factors for, um, as part of that female athlete triad, which is a low bone mass, the um, kind of low energy availability or, or eat disordered eating, and, um, and, and menstrual status. And this study showed that the prevalence of stress factors or bone stress injuries was far higher when uh, two to three of these risk factors were present, as well as having a low bone mineral density, uh, compared with those who um, had uh, the same number of risk factors, but the bone mineral density was, um, was above one. So there's clear evidence that that this um, kind of red S or female athlete trial and the risk factors that sit in these frameworks contribute uh, significantly to the risk of bone stress injuries. And I think it's important to kind of mention as well, this is also relevant in men. So there's also clinical data that shows that if men have low, um, experience low energy availability, and they suffer hypo um, kind of uh, gonadism in, in severe cases, then there's also an increased risk of stress factors in, in men as well. It's, it's not just a phenomena which is um, present in women, but is the estrogen status which probably plays quite a, a key role in the increased propensity of women to, to bone stress injuries. I'm not going to go into the kind of the whole kind of endocrinology of low energy availability, uh, but I just kind of want to point out here that um, energy availability has two effects. Um, a direct and an indirect effect on bone. So with low energy availability, menstrual status is affected um, and, with, um, and we see this in many other kind of clinical states that with, um, with kind of reduced eating, our nutritional intake, energy intake, um, amenorrhea can develop. And, and there's, there's an evolutionary kind of perspective on this as well, because it's hard to sustain a, a pregnancy with insufficient energy. And the menstrual cycle is a very energy sapping physiological event. So at the time of exercising, where the muscles and the brain obviously take priority for energy, the menstrual cycle um, essentially is, um, is inhibited. Uh, but what that results in terms of bone health is that estradiol and progesterone decrease and has a, a direct effect, an immediate effect on, on bone health. And the indirect effects, it really is um, on this kind of side of the, of the image. Um, and one of the important hormones which are affected by low energy availability is insulin-like growth factor one. And it's been kind of shown, and even in many of our studies, that with low energy, reduced energy availability, IGF-1 decreases, and that blunts bone adaptation. So what we have here is a classic bone uncoupling, where we have a decrease in bone, we have an increase in bone reabsorption because of this lack of steroid hormones. So we're shooting up the amount of, time, the amount of bone that's being reabsorbed, or, or the, the rate, and then we have a decrease in IGF-1, which means bone is not being reformed. So we have this uncoupling. So they, they could probably have um, kind of individual effects, separate effects, but also a combined effect on bone health. Um, I think another really important point to mention here is contraceptive use. So contraceptives, hormonal contraceptives are commonly used in athletes, around 50% of athletes. We see more kind of 60% in, in recruits. And many women take contraceptives in these environments of arduous training and wanting to kind of obviously plan competition or being out in the field. And they don't obviously experience the menstrual bleed um, at, at times where it's logistically difficult and it might obviously um, distract them. So it's, it's very common for athletes and, and, and other arduous physically trained populations to use hormonal contraceptives to suppress menstrual bleeding and to, or to control menstrual bleeding. Um, what we have in the middle here is what effects um, like the, the combined oral contraceptive can have on the natural uh, endogenous hormones. So here we have uh, estrogen and progesterone um, and, um, and hormonal contraceptives largely work by inhibiting the hypothalamic pituitary axis, so that connection between, between the brain and, and the, the reproductive organs. Now, there are a number of, um, a huge number of contraceptives that are available, and the, the most popular um, that we see at about 40 to, to 50 percent of use is the combined oral contraceptive pill, and that's also available as a progesterone-only preparation. 
Um, but they're also very commonly used, and the long-acting methods are becoming more popular, uh, particularly the marina coil, which causes more kind of local atropic effects in the uterus. We don't know what systemic effects that might be having. Uh, the injected contraceptive can, can, um, is commonly associated with amenorrhea, um, and then the implant. So these methods are becoming more popular, and these are progesterone-only preparations. So if we have a look at some of the data that we have in our cohort studies where we um, looked at, um, we monitored bone over 44 weeks of very arduous training, these are in our officer cadets, and we looked at those who were on the combined oral contraceptive pill, progesterone only preparations, and those who were um, not taking any form of contraceptives. And what we showed here is that, um, that this is trabecular thickness, so this is basically the microarchitecture of bone, and reducing the thickness of the trabeculi will impact on the ability to resist those, those axle loads. And we showed that the women who were on the progesterone only did not adapt at all. Uh, I've, I've kind of removed the kind of SDs on here, but the data are published in JBMR. And um, we showed that the uh, bone does not adapt during the whole of the 44 weeks of training. We did show that there were adaptations in the other two groups. And this in itself was a novel finding that actually, um, even post-adolescence, bone can still develop and respond acutely to arduous exercise. What we also showed, again, in this progesterone only group, sclerostin. Um, is secreted from the osteocyte. The osteocyte is a mechanical sensing um, cell. And when, uh, with loading and with exercise, sclerostin is suppressed, which enables bone adaptation. And we showed that sclerostin remained high in the progesterone-only contraceptive group. So it's having a, uh, an effect at that kind of cellular level. So we need to really understand this better uh, in order to obviously understand how we can mitigate um, bone stress injury risk. And, and these are data that, um, that, that we published fairly recently from a, from a bit of an older study where we used quantitative ultrasound to look at bone. This is like predating HRPQCT. Um, we, look, we, we, we wanted to examine the quality of the, of, the, of the cortical bone at the tibial site. So we used quantitative ultrasound sound. And we use the same method as well to look at the calcaneus, which is largely trabecular bone. And these are the contraceptive groups. This is the COCP, and these are the depo groups. And what we did show was that a significant difference in the quality of the cortical bone between the pill group and the, and the, the depo group, or rather these two groups um, were also significantly different from the women who didn't take any contraceptive. We didn't show any difference at the, at the trabecular site. There seemed to be very much a cortical-specific um, response. We also showed elevated increased bone turnover, both reabsorption and formation with depo. So there are some contraceptives which are more um, damaging to bone than others, and I think we need to kind of use this information to be able to inform athletes of, um, of more effective contraceptives that's also going to be obviously protective of their bone health. Um, and in the literature, there's a couple of studies, and there's not much, there's a lot more that we need to do on contraceptives and bone health. The clinical effect on bone stress injury risk is um, really unclear, um, but it seems to have a bigger effect on aerial BMD or bone mineral density in the younger age group, 14 to 18 years of age. So the women who are still developing and growing their bone and reaching their peak bone mass, um, COCPU seems to have a more uh, kind of ne negative impact on that population than older women. So there's a contraceptive specific effect, and there's also an age specific effect. So it's really quite complicated, um, particularly when we sort of try and identify our, um, our, our groups who are at greater risk. Um, I'm going to move on now to, to vitamin D, and this is a particular kind of passion I've been researching this for, for a very long time. Um, and, um, and vitamin D is a really important um, hormone for, for bone health. It increases, the, enhances the uptake of calcium from the gut. And vitamin D is largely produced from exposure to sunlight. Around 80% of the vitamin D that we produce is from exposure to sunlight. So if you cream up in the summer and um, you avoid the sunlight and you take no vitamin D, there's a high chance you're vitamin D deficient. Um, it's hydro, um, hydroxylated in the liver and further still in the kidneys. We use the, um, the 2508 as a marker of vitamin D status because it's far more kind of stable, if you like, um, compared with this biologically active metabolite 125, which is um, hydroxylated in, in the kidney. And, um, and PTH plays a really pivotal role. So when calcium is low um, uh, through, uh, through uh, possibly reduced uh, vitamin D, it has immediate um, uh, effect on the parathyroid gland to release PTH. And PTH is what directly affects bone and releases calcium from bone almost within minutes of being released. It has a really immediate effect. So again, is how do we target and kind of attenuate PTH, which has that direct stochastic effect on, on the skeleton. 
Um, and there's been a, a few studies. There's a lot of studies on vitamin D in the literature, and there's a lot of associated, vitamin D is associated with lots of clinical outcomes. But the vitamin D supplementation studies and the RCTs um, are not always positive. Some might be negative, or some basically really, they show nothing at all. So there's a lot that we need to understand about the metabolism of vitamin D if we are going to kind of provide advice on supplementation. And this systematic review was published a few years ago looking at um, the uh, effect of vitamin D on stress fracture risk. And uh, it showed that those with low vitamin D had an increased risk of stress fracture. Um, and that's been reported in quite a few studies. So what we need to really understand is, well, what happens if we, if we supplement with vitamin D? And that study's been done. It's been done in an RCT in female naval recruits in the US with a really high kind of, you know, a cohort study, and the, um, the recruits were supplemented with 800 IU a day and 2,000 mg of calcium a day, and I'm, I'm going to come back to that, uh, over eight weeks of training, and they demonstrated a 21% reduction in stress factor risk in training, and that's, that, that's, that's kind of, you know, that saves people in training and not being medically discharged, that's significant. Um, uh, but there's still, I think, a few questions that we have kind of on vitamin D. And some of the study, we've done large cohort studies on vitamin D. Um, there, we have vitamin D, D status across the top, determined by 250H. And above 50 is considered um, to be kind of sufficient vitamin D. Um, below 30 is deficient. And then insufficient really is, is kind of sits in between, in, in between those two thresholds. And what we've demonstrated in, in our large cohort study here is that even at um, kind of a low or uh, vitamin D deficient individuals, if their ratio of the, of the metabolites, 125 and, two, and 2425, is low, then PTH is very comparable, irrespective of the 250H concentrations. However, if 250H is below 30, and this ratio is high, so there's relatively higher concentration of 125 than it's uh, what was considered an inert 2425, then PTH increases significantly. And this is really important because it's PTH which has the effect on bone. So we need to understand how we can influence this ratio in terms of how we can modify um, and benefit from, from supplementing with vitamin D. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to move on, and we are looking at that in terms of bone stress injuries, and hopefully we'll have those data soon. I'm going to move on to calcium now. So calcium, 99.9% um, of, of bone is um, comprised of calcium. So bone is a calcium reservoir, and it's a calcium reservoir that when the body needs it to survive and for urgent um, needs, uh, metabolic needs, it draws it immediately from the skeleton. And so it's a really important skeleton, uh, um, kind of reservoir for the body. In this study with the RCT, they supplemented with 2,000 mg a day. Um, that's high. The RDI is typically 1 to 1,200 mg. Um, so they did supplement really high, and that's because they used a supplement that was 400 IU and um, combined with 1,000 IU calcium, but they wanted to take the vitamin D up to 800, and so there was this um, kind of combined effect of calcium. So this 21% this reduction might have been to do with the amount of calcium that was provided um, and that, at that much higher dose rather than just the, the vitamin D per se. And that's important because um, we, we've done quite a bit of work looking at how bone responds to training. And this is, again, this is the trabecular volumetric BMD. So this was taken at the bottom of the, the shin bone at the ultradistal site. But at the site where stress fractures develop, and this is the cortical volumetric BMD, in the first 14 weeks of arduous training, there was a significant decrease in volumetric BMD. And this is where our stress fracture rates tend to be highest. So the kind of the volume uh, of training and the support during this early stages of training are really important. And to provide sufficient calcium to lay down new bone is a really kind of important strategy. So the calcium status is really important, but it's, um, we, we have data where actually very few achieve the 1,000 mg a day. So again, monitoring and checking the calcium intake is likely to be a really important kind of approach to, to make it, mitigate bone stress injury risk um, of the appendicular skeleton. And I say appendicular skeleton because what, what we did show in the study was a significant decrease in the axial skeleton volumetric BMD. So our kind of hypothesis is that with insufficient um, calcium intake or insufficient vitamin D, the skeleton potentially is taking calcium, robbing it almost, from the, appendi the, the axial skeleton here to support the bone growth that we see at the appendicular system. So there's a lot going on here that we need to understand to really provide appropriate advice on mitigating bone stress injury risk. I've uh, just got a couple of slides to go. And, um, and we did a study with, um, with the uh, all-female unsupported team 
who trekked across the Antarctic. Uh, they actually beat their, beat their, 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 their goal. And, and again, we showed the same. Over three months, they lost a significant amount of body mass. They were, in, um, they, they were experiencing low energy availability. But their, their, their appendicular skeleton was kind of um, unchanged. They, they preserved the, uh, the, the, the bone at the, at the tibia. But again, they experienced a significant decrease in the axial skeleton um, of the volumetric BMD. So it's um, with weight-bearing exercise, seems to take preferential use of, of calcium. And um, again, even if we you know, um, achieve a reduction in BSIs here, we need to really understand at the same time of what's happening at other parts of the skeleton so that we preserve overall, overall bone health. So just a couple of kind of conclusions. The etiology of bone stress injuries is very complex, and it can really preventative strategies started at young age, where physical training history is really important to really promote um, bone, bone growth. Um, clearly, endocrine and nutritional deficits play a role, um, and they affect the ability of bone to resist the loads. It affects bone stiffness, um, but also can impair the, impair the ability to also repair damage. So with that decrease in IGF-1, there's a, a reduced ability to, to repair bone and pr to promote bone formation. Hormonal contraceptive use is common. Um, there wouldn't be advice to stop contraceptive use, and um, obviously there's a, that's a kind of an individual decision. But we need to really provide evidence-based advice on the best contraceptive to use, um, which also preserves bone health. Um, there's a clear need to preserve menstrual function. And this is a challenging one just in terms of education and kind of ensuring that menstrual status isn't seen as a barometer, a barometer of um, training status. Estrogen is really important, and that's a really important message to get across to runners. But this is a diagnosis of, of exclusion in runners. And if anybody experiences, any runner experiences functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, there are other causes um, of that that need to be investigated uh, before exercise-induced HP is, um, or F FHA rather, is, is, is identified. And there are now new NICE guidelines um, which recommends to, to help um, to restore bone health that HRT is used rather than oral contraceptives or hormonal contraceptives to really kind of um, replace the, the, the naturally um, kind of physiological levels of, of reproductive hormones. And there's cl a clear need probably to understand more but to optimise the provision of, of other bone protective nutrients. So just a few kind of recommendations here about preserving menstrual function with, with feeding. I think there's a, an onus on, on athletes to also self-monitor to know what they're eating, probably working with um, their, their kind of uh, health team uh, to monitor signs of the, of the female athlete triad and there are models out in the literature that can be used or frameworks um, and obviously following the NICE guidelines the option of hormone replacement therapy if refeeding is not restoring um, functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. Uh, I haven't mentioned sleep. That's really critical, and there's a lot more we are doing on this at the moment. And we have some early evidence that actually sleeping um, for six hours or more has a more protective effect on BSIs than, than those who have less than five hours sleep. Um, and psychological stress, I haven't really talked about this, but it's really important if we are really working on these um, tenets of the, of the triad that we, there's a, there's a, there's a fourth dimension. <laughs> um, kind of terminology plagiarism there, but um, I think importantly we need to be looking at psychological health as well as um, other aspects of the trial. So I think there is a really important component here. And there's a great study published in 61, 1961 by Drew who looked at the uh, prevalence of um, menstrual disorders in across a huge range of populations and found that in women who were on death row, they experienced 100% prevalence of, um, of amenorrhea. So those, the psychological stress and the, the link between the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and gonadal axis is a close one. And for, the, for women who are obviously experiencing competitive stress, have difference in response cortisol, then um, that's a really important, um, I think, uh, kind of kind of issue to address. Uh, and uh, I've already kind of mentioned these. And lastly, and I haven't gone into this at all just because of time, but NSAID use has been shown to increase the risk of BSIs twofold higher in military recruits complete, compared to those who don't use um, NSAIDs. Um, so it's really important that we also kind of look at more than just the classical frameworks that are really out in the, in the published domain. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Hiya, thanks. Um, what sort of early warning signs, if any, are there that you could look out for um, with uh, athletic populations to try and prevent um, the uh, bone stress injuries? 
I think if we're looking at the risk factors for bone stress injuries initially, um, and, uh, and uh, are you, are you talk about from a the science for low energy availability or for bone stress injuries? I'm just thinking from a practical, let's say a cultural sports scientist point of view, um, and you're working with athletes, is there anything that you think, well, this is sort of key signs, maybe early things, look out for this, uh, red flags that might be sort of uh, simple that you could look out for that could help you sort of maybe then investigate further? There the probably risks. are. The, the, um, some of those signs, for example, could be um, kind of more rapid onset of fatigue, um, kind of signs of overtraining, those kind of indications that there's an imbalance between kind of energy intake and obviously the amount of the volume of training or changes, sudden changes in training. Um, and that could be return from injury or, or return from having a break. Uh, so those kind of training patterns. So the behavioural, there are some behavioural signs um, that might be a kind of a red flag uh, for, for, for injury. Of course, what's less kind of clear is um, kind of more intrinsically about what that kind of bone health actually is like. But there, there, there are potential behavioural um, kind of signs that, that might just flag that there might need to be some kind of engagement advice um, back to the athlete. Thank you. Uh, just behind you. Hi, I've got a couple of questions. So the first um, the study where that you showed there was a higher rate of bone stress injury in amenorrheic women. Does that include women who are amenorrheic because they're on a contraceptive type or is that only women not on contraception? So were you referring to some data I showed that? Yes, yeah, so you showed uh, women who were amenorrheic, there was a higher rate of bone stress injury. They were not taking hormonal contraceptives. So none of them were yeah. hormonal contraceptive. And then the other one, the study comparing um, those on combined oral contraceptives with the depo injection, was it just looking at women on depo progesterone only contraception or did it include women on other progesterone only? Methods of contraception. It was just the one single contraceptive. So just the depo, yeah. so that you have you haven't studied kind of progesterone only pill or Mirena or. No, and, and it's interesting because in, in our population, and we're just about to publish the data, we show that um, in military recruits, like 5,000 women, um, that 8% take both a, a lark, long acting, and also a um, an oral pill. Um, so they might kind of with a lark kind of suffer um, bleeding that they want to control. Uh, and I've never seen those data in the literature before where there's a double method. And, and that's really interesting because they're going to have differential effects on bone. So what we, what we show, particularly with, um, with contraceptives, is because it's decreasing the natural estrogen, it's allowing the bone to almost experience periosteal expansion with exercise, but at the cost of reduced volumetric bone density. So it's like which aspect of bone health is probably more important to resist the bending stresses is, is like a million dollar question really. So there are differential effects between even eumenorrheic women and contraceptives, but then the depo is like a chemical menopause anyway. So that's just basically um, having a similar effect as, as obviously the natural menopause um, and having a detrimental effect on volumetric BMD. And that effect can occur even within two years of use. Um, and so I think if there's one contraceptive which is more likely to be the most harmful to bone over the longer term, it would be depo. We are doing a study at the moment where we are comparing because there's not much out there on the implant, nothing on the marina coil. So we're looking at these different contraceptives and we're looking at what effect does it have on tendon, on, on the muscle and on the bone as well, as well as a load of other kind of biochemical markers because there's just not much information out there. Thank you very much. It's a GP who uh, prescribes lots of combined oral contraception for period control into 14 and 18 to 18 year olds. Um, just find this data quite frightening. We counsel them, we try to avoid depot uh, because of its effects on, on uh, bone. Um, but I don't think any of us have ever thought about uh, the effects of bone uh, of the combined contraception and probably need to be doing more so. We need to really understand that, I think, um, to really kind of protect that, that you know, because it's at a really critical time of achieving peak bone mass. What, what happens with contraceptives, it also has the first liver pass effect, so it decreases IGF-1. So at a time when bone is trying to fall and to really enhance peak bone mass, 
an increase in IGF-1 is going to attenuate that ability for, for bone or, or impairing bone formation. So it, again, it's acting in a different way to depo. So there's different mechanisms and different actions on bone. Um, so it's interesting because with our one study, they, they compared different age groups. It was more protective in 19 years and plus, but it was harmful for those who were in the younger age group. So, and that's, that's because it's a period of bone growth. So if we are affecting hormone concentration, when the body probably needs the natural endogenous progesterone and estrogen, then, um, then again, COCP could potentially be blunting our, our, our peak bone mass. We need to understand that better. And can I just add as well, we've got more and more tendency to, to use tailored pill taking uh, so that women have fewer periods uh, because the contraceptive effect of that is, is better and safer in preventing babies. But again, is that more likely to have a detrimental effect to bone? That hasn't been investigated to my knowledge. I know there's now obviously a um, kind of an agreement that pills can be taken back to back. We see that a lot in our own population, um, just taking the contraceptive pills with, you know, without having that kind of weekly with, with, with dual period. Um, but what we are looking at in our study is what happens during that week of, of no pill, but we are not looking at what happens if they have the continuous. So I, again, I think there are so many big knowledge gaps here that in terms of bone health, longer term as well as bone stress injury risk that really needs to be understood. Um, thank you very much, Julie. I'm going to draw to a close as much as we can keep going. Thank uh, you. Julie will be around at, at the break to answer any more questions. So let's give her a big round of applause. Thank you very much.